Hello, hello everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. This is Jason Dahl, and I am here with Alp Adebeck, uh, remotely of course, today to discuss our current outlook on this unprecedented market and economic environment. First, we want to extend our best wishes to everyone and hope that you and your families are all doing well during uh, these, I guess you could say, strange days is one way to put it. Um, so before we kind of get, get started, I also want to go over just a few uh, housekeeping items. So this is being recorded. Uh, we expect to have the recording ready and available to send out um, by close of business tomorrow. Um, we have received many questions in advance that we uh, plan to go over, but as we go, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So that works kind of like a chat box. Um, the Q&A one is actually better than the chat box, so we encourage you to use the Q&A option where you can type in questions. We will keep, in our, keep our eye out for those and try to address everything the best we can. We are going to do our best to try to keep this to between 45 minutes and an hour. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. So just real simple kind of agenda here. And the, the first item there, we wanted to just take a moment to provide just a real quick update on our team. So last week we implemented a mandatory work from home protocol. And we have been extremely impressed with how our team has stepped up to the plate to ensure our office runs like business as usual. For us, we are considered an essential business, and we have been maintaining our operations at full capacity, albeit remotely, through conference calls and video meetings. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we want to thank all of you who have reached out to us to see how we are doing. We really appreciate it. Uh, it has undoubtedly been a stressful time for us all, but we have confidence in our economy and know the markets will bounce back. Um, so then we're going to, as you can see here, just go over several items. As I mentioned before, we have received a number of questions in advance. We've also identified several frequently asked questions that people have, have asked us over the last few weeks, so we're going to go over those. And like I said, please feel free to submit questions as we go along. Um, this is one of uh, Alp and my favorite quotes from uh, Warren Buffett. I'm sure everybody knows who Warren Buffett is, and Alp and I always joke that during any presentation, Whenever we say the name Warren Buffett, everybody seems to put their phone down and look up and listen. <laughs> um, and we just thought that this uh, this quote here in particular was a uh, was a uh, salient <laughs> given today's today's market action or the recent market action, let's just say. So I'm going to turn this over to Alp. He's going to kind of take the lead here on the next uh, the next few slides. Uh, so Alp, are you all set to go? I am, and I just want to confirm that you can hear me because I uh, I know that we are in two different locations. You you got me? We are. I, yep, I, you're coming through loud and clear to me. Perfect. Hey, I'll leave it on this slide for a second. Uh, uh, and I and I mentioned uh, like we are in different locations. This is the first time that we are actually trying to do this uh, in different locations. So uh, usually we're in the same room together, and we can actually give each other signals on who's going to talk on what slide. So. We might have a few uh, missteps here, but uh, we apologize in advance. On the Warren Buffett subject, uh, uh, we've written about this in our newsletters. Mr. Buffett was sitting on approximately $130 billion in cash in Berkshire Hathaway. Now, he needs about 40 to $50 billion. He's mentioned that in the past, just as spending money. No, I'm joking. He needs like 40 <laughs> to $50 million in his company just to prepare for any type of unforeseen circumstances. So... He does have about you know, 80 billion that he is ready to invest. And he's been mentioning that he's been accumulating cash because he did not see any great values out there. And I know a number of the questions that we've received have talked about, you know, should you be moving money to the sidelines? And so if you look at that Buffett quote, right, this is a time when you want to be greedy when others are fearful. I'm fairly confident when he issues his earnings report for the March 31st quarter, they will reference how much of that money that they deployed. And my guess is it's gonna be a substantial amount. But if you wanna move ahead, Jason. Yep. So, so what's going on with the markets? This is not gonna be our typical market update. In the past, we've used the quarterly JP Morgan slides that do a great job of helping investors compare current valuations versus historical valuations. 
Today, we're going to focus on what we believe has quickly moved us from a healthy but extended bull market into a bear market in a matter of weeks. So what happened? Let's call it the perfect storm. Believe it or not, that movie was released in the year 2000. I was surprised to see that was 20 years ago. While the markets were stretched at the start of 2020 and, over, and, and overdue for a meaningful pullback, especially after the run-up in 2019, nobody predicted a virus would trigger a sell-off that put an end to an almost 11-year-old bull market. Worry over the virus triggered the downward movement in the markets, but what escalated the volatility and sent the markets into a freefall was possibly the most poorly timed breakup in the history of OPEC. A three-year pact between OPEC and Russia in place to control oil prices ended on March 6, which resulted in OPEC removing all limits on its own production on Sunday, March 8. Essentially, they were going to be flooding the markets with oil. That sent oil into a tailspin that Sunday afternoon, which then sent the already fragile markets into an accelerated downturn on Monday. For consumers, lower oil prices are considered a positive because it saves you money every time you fill up the car. So what spooked the markets regarding oil? Here's the problem. Let's say you're an oil producer and you have a billion dollars of loans outstanding to support your operations, and it costs you $40 to produce a barrel of oil. If oil is selling for $25 a barrel, you have a big problem. You will not continue producing because you're losing money on every barrel. And remember, you owe your lenders a billion dollars. So when oil prices collapsed, it brought into question whether the oil producers would be able to service their debts. And think about the hundreds of billions of loans made to oil producers that can't be paid back if oil prices stay below what it costs to produce a barrel of oil. The sudden collapse in oil just absolutely rattled the markets. At the same time oil was collapsing, the spread of the virus outside of China was accelerating. That fear escalated as the virus rapidly spread through Spain and Italy, and worries mounted that it would spread through the U.S. in the same fashion. And as we've discovered, the only real solution to contain the virus is to shut down the economy, something that has never done before. And while it seems simple in principle, the financial ramifications of shutting down the economy are overwhelming. On top of those two issues, we have to deal with the computerized trading programs and the short sellers. For years, we've been writing in our newsletters that computerized trading programs are controlling the markets. The programs are designed to identify trends in the markets and exploit them. They don't care what direction the market is moving, the programs will go long the market, betting that the market will go higher and push prices higher if the trend is up and immediately flip to a short position, which is betting against the markets when they see a trend materializing to the downside. What we have noticed over the years, <clears throat> excuse me, is the trading programs accelerate the downside action. In other words, the markets will go down considerably faster than they went up. For example, the recent sell-off wiped out three years of gains in a little over a month. We saw the same thing happen in the fourth quarter of 2018. In addition to that, the short sellers who are betting the markets will go lower pile on when they see the market selling off, driving share prices even lower. We felt the government should have put a temporary ban on short selling to reduce the velocity of the downfall in the market, but they didn't do it. China in the past has actually done it in some of their markets when they've had a lot of turmoil. It would have actually been a good solution. So it's actually been the perfect storm, the coronavirus, the collapse in oil prices, the computerized trading programs, and the short sellers. So now we're going to talk about the domino effect. So I want to introduce you to this concept and think about the airline industry. The airline industry has pretty much shut down. Think of how widespread the damage is when the airlines are not flying. I'll give you the obvious, pilots, 
flight attendants, airport workers, maintenance personnel, taxi, and even the Uber drivers, they will get laid off or not have the opportunity to earn money in the case of the taxi and Uber drivers. The longer they are out of work, the more difficult it will be for them to pay their mortgages, their rent, and credit card bills. It doesn't stop there. If the airlines are doing poorly, they won't take delivery of new planes, which affects Boeing, Airbus, and all of their suppliers. They will all be forced to lay off workers. And it doesn't stop there. Think of all the debts the airlines carry. Planes are expensive. If you're a bank and holding that debt, you are worried about collecting it. The domino effect goes on and on, and that's just the airline industry. Think of the hotel and hospitality industries, the cruise line, the restaurants, all have been directly affected by the virus and have had their revenue sources dry up. It's not just the businesses that are suffering, all of their employees, suppliers, bankers, et cetera, are suffering as well. This morning, I read the Cheesecake Factory made the decision to not pay rent at their 300 restaurants. Others will make the same decision. So you can see how this is gonna roll into the landlords. Over the weekend, an attorney told me that one of his clients called him to say that he was owed $15 million from a customer and that customer filed for bankruptcy protection. This will result in the company owed the money to default on all of its own financial obligations. So again, this is the domino effect, and that's why the government needs to get involved to shore up both the big and small businesses that are directly affected by the virus. So, so what actions are the government taking? The government can address these issues through both monetary and fiscal policy. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy was swift and spot on. They quickly cut rates to zero, flooded the markets with liquidity, and dusted off the playbook from the financial crisis and added a few new plays as well. They've basically thrown the kitchen sink at it. They've been very aggressive in their response, exactly what is needed. And now Congress is coming through with a massive stimulus designed to backstop both individuals and businesses. We think the fiscal response will be a work in progress. They will make mistakes. They will be forced to come up with additional stimulus measures, but hopefully they will do enough to restore confidence in our economy and financial markets. They are trying to get capital to the businesses and industries that are most directly affected by the virus. The goal is to backstop those industries to help them avoid laying off millions of employees. This will be costly. We expect the final bill to be well in excess of $2 trillion, which will be added to the 20 plus trillion of debt owed already by our country. They have no choice. They need to take these emergency measures, which will allow our economy to heal more rapidly after the virus is contained. Keep in mind, this is playing out all over the world. So now we have a little bit on market history. So this is a great slide that shows you some statistics on how long it usually takes for the market to recover after sell-offs. We've actually gotten a lot of questions on this. And you can just see that 33% uh, of market downturns recover within a month, 50% recover within two months, 80% recover within one year. And this is basically what we're kind of dealing with, but a little bit different. 95% of the time, those big once or twice in a lifetime drops return in three years. Now, I think some of the other um, like once, in a, you know, once or twice in a lifetime drops were more of like longer term problems. This was a sudden issue. So, you know, our general feeling is we think we're going to recover quicker than that. So our next slide is annual returns and intra-year declines. This is a slide we've gone over in our quarterly updates. This is Jason's favorite slide, so I'm gonna let him take it over. <laughs> Thank you, Al. Yeah, I think this slide does an excellent job of just kind of reminding us how normal market action is in any given year and recognizing that, hey, this these past three weeks, four weeks, you could argue aren't necessarily normal, but in some respects, 
it is normal to have big swings in the market. And so this chart, just to walk it through to make sure we're all understanding what we're seeing here, these gray bar charts represent the year-end return for the S&P 500. So in 1980, for example, the S&P 500 finished the year up 26%. In 1981, finished the year down 10%, and so on. So you see how since 1980, all the year-end performances in the S&P 500, all the way through here, this is through uh, March 17th of this this year, represented here. So this is what the market, wh where the market was at on March 17th. So now, a couple, you know, just first observations. As it notes here, annual returns were positive in 30 of the 40 years. However, and here's where I think it gets really interesting, and when you look at these red dots, now the red dots, what they represent is the largest intra-year decline. So again, for example, in 1980, even though the market finished, the S&P 500 finished the year positive 26%, at one point during the year, it dropped 17%. Right, so if you look at this every single year, right, there's always a red dot somewhere down in the negative territory. Well, I guess there's one exe exception here, <laughs> um, and and where we've drawn these red lines, this was just to point out this first year, but then these next two years in '95 and in 2017, those were those were in our view the really abnormal, unusual years to have such a calm year where the largest entry year decline was only 3%, right? So you can see here, and the average, as it's noted up here, the average entry year dropped just shy of 14%. Okay, so I, I always like going over this, not only just to kind of help uh, keep my own perspective, but to help everybody kind of remember that the markets drop. That's what happens. That's an, that is part of playing the game, being an investor. Um, but over the long term, as we see here, 30 out of four, the last 40 years, finished the year positive. I've, obviously, remains to be seen where we go from here. So let's uh, let's talk about that more. Alp, I'm going to turn this back over to you. So this is actually a, a great slide, like the impact of being out of the market. And if you take a look at it, it's fairly self-explanatory. And so performance of a $10,000 investment between January 3rd, 2000 and December 31st, 2019. So with the S&P 500, a 6.06% return, 10,000 grew to 32,421. But if you miss the best 10 days of the market, your total return is now dropped to 16,180 days. If you miss the best 20 days, you're basically break even. If you miss the best 30 days, you're underwater, 40 days, further underwater, and so on. So, you know, it really is important to stay invested. But we know for some people, you know, we work with a lot of people that just have gotten nervous and they just want to be safe, and that's fine. So, but if you're uh, I'll say on the younger side and, and you're not worried about the longer term, you still got a long, a lot of years to work. It really makes a lot of sense just to always stay fully invested. In the middle of the page, they've got six of the best 10 days occurred within two weeks of the 10 worst days. So the best day of 2015, August 26th, was only two days after the worst day, August 24th. So it's just a fascinating slide, just a great example of what can happen if you miss some of these bounce back days like we've had over the last few days. But again, we understand how difficult it is for a lot of investors, especially when you get a prolonged downturn. And this particular one, uh, some of the statistics are overwhelming. I think the velocity of our downfall was basically in history only rivaled with the downturn during the Great Depression in 1929. So that shows you how fast the markets move to the downside. And as I mentioned earlier, really a lot of that is because of the computerized trading programs and the short sellers. So looking forward, Tuesday's and Wednesday's market action was the first two-day rally since early February. So think about that. We had not put two days together in a row for over six 
weeks in the Dow. I think for the S&P 500, it might have been about five weeks or so. But no way to know if we've turned a corner and the worst is behind us. A major focal point in the coming weeks will be on job losses and the unemployment rate. Some speculate we could see unemployment jump to 20%. This morning, new jobless claims came in at 3.28 million and the market didn't flinch. It was expecting a big number, so you could say that it was discounted into the markets. Yesterday on CNBC, former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke commented that he thought the spike in unemployment will quickly reverse out in the second half of the year. It was nice to hear that, and I hope he's right. We are likely already in what we are calling a flash recession. A recession is defined as two successive quarters of negative GDP. JP Morgan is calling this a social, distancy rece social distancing recession. The odds are high that the abrupt shutdown of the economy in March will result in negative growth for the first quarter. A sharp contraction in the second quarter is already baked into the markets. A big positive, the US economy entered this period of uncertainty from a position of strength. The economy was robust. The unemployment rate at 3.5% was at historic lows. The consumer was in great shape and corporate earnings were strong. We shudder at the thought of what the damage to the economy would have been if we had to battle this pandemic in 2009 while our economy was suffering in the aftermath of the credit crisis. So again, if you look at it from a timing perspective, if there could ever, if there could ever have been a good time to have had this happen, it is now. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Look across the globe to China, the first country to experience the onslaught of the virus. Apple has now reopened all 42 of its stores in China and Starbucks has reopened more than 90% of its stores in the country, including a few stores in Wuhan, the epicenter of the virus. Additionally, China has closed down its last coronavirus centers because there are not enough new cases to, to warrant keeping them open, as the country reported no new local cases for the first time since this pandemic began. Also, this is America. We have always risen to the challenge and this time will be no different. We are taking all of the necessary steps to confront the virus and the economic destruction it has and will continue to cause, and we will emerge in a few months confident in our direction. This is not the case of an athlete suffering a career-ended shredded knee. This is a broken arm. We'll be out of commission for a few months, but we will be back in full strength after the healing is done. Our nation will be tentative at first, which is to be expected, but at some point, this setback will be a distant memory. Life as we previously knew it will return. Businesses will resume normal operations. The strong jobs market will return. I don't know how much longer that'll last. It's been an incredibly long rally in jobs. Schools will reopen. Planes will be crowded again. Hotels will get booked and restaurants will be packed. Before we go to your questions, I'd like to tell you what Bill Miller, a grizzled 50-year vet of the market, said a few days ago on CNBC. He said in his career, there have been four great buying opportunities in the aftermath of bear markets, and we are now in the midst of the fifth one. Also, other than the devastating loss of lives, which can't be discounted, this really is a problem that you can literally throw money at to resolve and the market will learn from this experience and be much better prepared if it happens again in the future. One last comment before we go to questions. Most people don't recognize this. We are already in the healing process. Think about it. That process starts the moment you recognize the problem and start treating the symptoms. We immediately came in with heavy doses of monetary policy, and now we are starting to administer the fiscal policy which is exactly the medicine we need to continue the healing process. There will be setbacks, things we didn't think about, but we will address them as they come up the same way they do when one is battling an illness. So now let's take a look at the questions. 
All right. Thank you, Alp. And thank you, everybody, for uh, submitting questions in advance and, and sharing questions as we've been going throughout. So let's start here, Alp. We had a, one of the first questions we re received, um, and, you know, and you've been talk touching on this a little bit already. It's just kind of give us your overview and forecasts for market trends. Well, so, you know, I think we've somewhat addressed this. Uh, it's difficult to know exactly when the bottom will be, but I'm a firm believer that, you know, to date that the market is undefeated. It has always moved higher in the long haul. So I think the trend, as soon as we get control of the virus, will be to continue the recovery process. And I think all the people betting against the market will have to cover their shorts and we should stabilize. And at some point, the volatility will subside. Yeah, I know one thing that that I always think about and, and been thinking about a lot recently is whenever there's a market sell-off, you know, no matter how deep, no matter how, you know, what what was the cause, and like we were looking at that slide earlier with those red dots, no one is able to identify where that red dot was, right, where the bottom was, until many months, in some cases years after that bottom has occurred. Right, and so that that also kind of plays back into the uh, the slide that Alp went over about talking about you know the importance of staying invested and not missing those best days. Um, all right, so uh, here here's one for you, Alp. How is it looking for uh, quote unquote back to normal by Easter? So, yeah, I'm going to try to preserve from being political. I'll just say I think that was a uh, a tough quote for the president to make. Uh, I'd be surprised if we're not in lockdown still. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I find it hard to believe that we'll be anywhere near back to normal by Easter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you've raised a couple of the good points about, you know, the things in China with the Apple stores reopening, the Starbucks stores reopening, kind of life getting back to normal. And that will happen here, but let's keep in mind that, you know, that was, that was probably a nine week process once, once China kind of fully acknowledged and recognized the gravity of the issue and, and implemented the uh, their response. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. Um, all right, so let's kind of shift gears here a little bit, Alp, on some of the questions. We ha had a number of questions kind of along this theme. Uh, what is your advice for the immediate future? Well, I say and most then, importantly, and then, and then I'll, and I'm going to throw in a, a kind of a follow up here. Stay in or pull out of the market. So, I mean, most importantly, I'll say stay safe. Um, and I'll throw in one thing that I think a lot of us could do uh, to help the small business world out is if there's a way you can help support your favorite small business, if they're offering carry out if it's a restaurant, uh, or just be very mindful of the workers when we do get back to normal, you know, maybe bigger tips, things like that to just try to, uh, you know, help out. Uh, but when it comes to the immediate future uh, for the markets, uh, again, I think you have to expect that there's going to continue, there's going to be continued volatility. You know, there's going to be something that happens that catches us off guard and you'll see some setbacks. But uh, and I, as I said, I don't know if we've uh, hit a bottom. But overall, as I mentioned, uh, I think we're doing all the right things. So I would just, uh, you know, stay invested. So when you go to the second part of the question, uh, you know, we've been firm believers that you stay invested. But if you get too nervous, there's no, nothing wrong with doing a little bit of trimming. One of the things that we think will happen on the way back up and there's this concept called overhead resistance. And what that means is as the markets move higher, we will hit some resistance from some people that will say, you know, I'm going to take a little bit off the table as we move higher and move to a higher reserve allocation. So, uh, you know, my general feeling is that you can expect that to happen at some point. Uh, but uh, definitely stay in, especially if you're a long term investor. Yeah, there were a couple other questions here. I think you know, kind of along those same same lines. You know, where do we go from here, up or down? Uh, how long will the recovery take once we hit bottom? Um, you know, as, as we commented earlier, you know, we won't really know where the bottom was until well after many months after it's it's occurred. Uh, but also recognizing that no recovery um, is a straight line, right? And that that's it's, it's so difficult to uh, to recognize the bottom until until a long time after it's happened, right? No one, no one sort of rings the bell and says, "Okay, all clear, everybody back in," <laughs> right? It, it's going to be bumpy for for a while here, um, and and you know while it, while it has been you know sort of two steps back, one step forward, 
now for several weeks, you know, hopefully we can sort of reverse that trend and start having, you know, more, more series of two steps forward, one step back, but it's, but it's not going to be a smooth, smooth ride for a while. Um, so Jason, I want to go with, uh, um, go, go back a couple of questions and, uh, yeah, it, you know, where should we invest uh, remaining money? So we have minimal losses yeah. in the future. And, and one thing I just want to address on that particular subject, uh, it, you know, one thing that we always try to stress is it depends on whether you're investing for yourself or the next generation. So if you're really dependent on the money that you actually need a lot of it uh, in, in the short and intermediate term, then it really makes sense to, to have some uh, money put on the sidelines. But if you already have a certain amount of money on the sidelines, and I know, you know, our dear friend that asked this question, uh, we know there's probably five to 10 years of cash just sitting on the sidelines as it is. So our general view in situations like that, if you know you're not gonna have to tap into the markets, we generally believe that you should maintain the same type of exposure in just great long-term companies. And again, I realize everyone gets more you know, nervous or some people get more nervous than other people, but uh, try to really think very long-term, you know, other than let's say going into uh, you know truly investment grade bond funds, which the yields are going to be very low since interest rates are so low right now, it's difficult to really get any growth in anything other than being in the equity markets. Okay, what, what's next, Jason? Mm -hmm. Should I wait to make the payment into my IRA this month until this blows over? So this is a great question. I think one of the beauties of mm -hmm. any type of uh, uh, this happens to be a simple IRA, but so it's a work-related uh, retirement plan. But one of the beauties of uh, you know 401k plans is they they always practice the concept of dollar cost averaging. So we're big believers of just while well, the market is lower and you're going to be feeding this for 20 to 30 more years. This is exactly what you want to happen. As painful as that is, when we're in front of uh, a crowd at companies talking about the markets, we're always telling the younger people in the in the crowd that they actually want sell-offs. They should want to buy in at lower prices. You know, for the older crowd, I'm 59 years old now, I'll joke and say, I kind of want more of that uh, smooth sailing as I head towards those retirement years. But the reality is for people with a long runway before they retire, they should actually welcome these type of, you know, market uh, discounts and take advantage of them. So I'd invest and on schedule. Yeah, and I would even I would even kind of tack on to that that even even uh, though you're a you're more mature Alpa, uh, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you're closer to that that retirement date. You know, you're you're not going to need you know any anyone who who retires, you're not going to need all the money in your account right in that that first year, right? And so most folks, even once they're in retirement, they have still have 15, 20, 25, could be 30 years ahead of them in retirement. Right. Um, and so so for a lot of folks who they, they still need to maintain some eye to the long term with with, you know, with some portion of the por of their portfolio, um, but also recognizing as 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 you addressed a moment ago too, Alp is, OK, well, what are what are your current cash needs? Are you drawing money out of the account now or to live off of to pay bills? Um, you know, to pay for travel once we can do that again, <laughs> um, and that, you know, it, so it's so it's a, it's a slightly different formula, but but it's not it's not like you need to go all the cash once you're in retirement, right? You still need to maintain one eye longer term. All right, so let's come here to another question: Is this the long anticipated correction, or will another correction follow this one, assuming the markets bounce back? So I'm going to say that uh, this is clearly. You know more than a correction. You know we've now clearly gone into a uh, a bear market, which is defined as a 20% loss in the market. So we've gone past that. So this ended the 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 old bull market, um, but because of how it ended, I actually believe that the economy will pick back up again and we'll probably go back into more favorable markets. So I think we'll always have another correction, but this one will obviously take a lot of the uh, complacency out of uh, what was that was starting to develop in, in the prior markets, which is always kind of a warning sign anyway that we're about to have a pullback. So, you know, this is, I'll call it the long anticipated bigger correction or bigger pullback. So, so up to that point, you know, so assuming this is sort of in all caps, the correction, right? The, 
that, that we're kind of in the midst of the the, the big one at the moment. Um, any recommended changes to strategy or portfolio allocation? You know, whether it be whether it be you know somebody's if they're a government employee, their TSP or uh, just a 401k, IRAs, so forth. So I think it really depends on your age. Um, and if you're investing for yourself, as I mentioned earlier, for the next generation, as, as we said, so many times we have people that all they do is take out their minimum distribution out of their retirement accounts. So that account can be, I'll say, uh, very aggressively or more aggressively invested for the long haul. But one of the strategies that I think some people should think about, this is a great time to rebalance 401k accounts where yes. the equity portion has lowered. So if you're trying to maintain about a 70% market exposure, that might've dropped to 58, 59%. What happens with pension plans, whenever we have sell-offs, they have many pension plans, not 401ks, but when the company has a, a pension plan, they have provisions in their plan documents that call for automatic rebalancing every quarter. And one of the magical things at times we see with the markets as we move towards the end of a quarter, if we're in the midst of a sell-off, you see traders trying to get ahead of the pension rebalancing because they know there's going to be buyers coming in. So if you look at that cue, I would tell you this is a good time to rebalance a portfolio to get to the equity allocation that you want to be. Um, and if you're trying to be a little bit more aggressive, this is a good time to actually add additional exposure. Yep, yep, yeah. I mean, so much of it, right, is, as we said before, we, we always knew there was going to be another – correction or bear market right that but no one knew, knew exactly when it was going to happen what was going to cause it and and there will be another one again in the future right and that's how, how, why it's so important to to have that proper allocation in advance right but proactively um you know knowing hey is is a 70 30 mix like you said a 70 percent equity allocation is that the right mix for me or 60 40 or 50 50 right it all depends on on your your unique needs and comfort level with investing um and the idea being that yeah in a time like this hey it presuming that plan was still appropriate then you have re this is a good opportunity to kind of rebalance your account back to that that target to stick with your with your long-term plan all right so here's a, a little drilling in, in more detail question now uh, gold real estate foreign assets or stay the course so i would say uh generally i'm going to say stay diversified and, and probably one of the, yeah. like a, the best ways to think about staying diversified is you know think of the, the sport of golf for, for those that are golfers uh there's 14 clubs in the bag and you don't always use them all but it's nice to have them when you need them and so it makes a lot of sense to basically stay you know well diversified and just continue to believe that over the long haul diversification will benefit you you know one of the things that we've noted for years in the last 10 years diversification has not really helped that much because the US market has outperformed but historically there's just a lot of evidence that always says it reverses out and you'll see asset classes that have underperformed outperformed and things that have outperformed typically start underperforming so you know the goal is to spread it out uh, on the subject of gold in itself i would just say that uh you know gold is one of those things that it's just a great fear trade some people think you should have it in every portfolio and they would talk about a five to ten percent allocation it's a good inflation hedge so everyone's different on that. We've typically not been a big buyer of gold, but have added it when clients have asked to see it in their portfolios. Uh, you know, real estate specifically, um, I think when it comes to real estate right now, it's probably just the same old uh, rule that we've always had. It's about location, location, location. If you're looking into, uh, you know, buying into any, any of the REITs that have been hit pretty hard in this downturn, I would actually say that's a good time to buy into them as long as you can, find out if the if the underlying companies that are in the REITs are well capitalized, because I think this just, is going to test the capitalization of the real estate investment trust. Go ahead, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to say, just clarify what you were referring to, the REIT, real estate investment trust. Thank you. Yep. Um, good. Here's one um, regarding uh, kind of the fiscal policy. Will the stimulus bill benefit me? Sounds like it will benefit the corporations and the desperate, but not the middle. 
So that's really a, an interesting question. And I'll say it really depends on how you look at it, because I believe that there'll be some people that are going to get direct benefits out of the bill, but all of this will get indirect benefits out of it. Because Absolutely. if they can shore up the economy and shore up the businesses, that will help the markets recover. And typically the people that are not going to get direct payments from the government, or if their business won't qualify, they're still going to do better because the other businesses have been supported. So I actually think that it was wise for them not to give money to everybody. They should give it to those that have been most directly affected by this. So, you know, for now I'll say, I think the uh, stimulus bill is, is, is a fairly good initial step. I haven't read like if they have a bunch of, uh, I'll call it pork in it, like they had in TARP back in 2008 and 2009. Hopefully they avoided that, but I think it'll benefit us, all of us indirectly. Yeah. Um, all right. So kind of back to sort of the market action here. I'm just thinking about there being another short-term dip if slash when additional COVID-19 cases come over the next few weeks. Uh, and months, and how to avoid going to the bottom with the rest of the market. So again, we, we've kind of shown that slide where it's difficult to miss out on those good yeah. days. So, you know, the only real answer is we can put on some form of hedges, but then the hedge will work against you. If the market moves up, you'll lose money on the hedge, or you can actually reduce exposure in your account, and that will limit some of the downside. Uh, but if you believe in the long haul that we will be through this situation at some point, you know, it's that classic, really silly answer of, and we've heard it from a lot of clients that go, you know, I'm avoiding actually looking at my statements right now. Uh, and it doesn't make it easier. The, the money, the accounts have gone down in value, but uh, I generally think you have to take a very long-term approach. Uh, uh, and that's the only way to kind of get through this other than reducing exposure in the markets. So now kind of, Flipping it around and looking at it at a slightly different angle here. What would you suggest for someone that has, you know, money out of the market, you know, ready to drop in at the best time? Dollar cost averaging. You talked a little bit about that already, and then it has a specific question here around an ETF such as the Russell 3000. Would that be a possibility? Sure. I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. If you're, you know, I'll say investing on your own, uh, probably one of the simplest things is just to buy a, a broad-based index. Uh, I would probably lean more towards the bigger companies right now, because I think they're gonna be better capitalized and probably have less of a disruption. So I'd think more towards something like the, you know, the, the NASDAQ 100 on the aggressive side or the S&P 500 or S&P 100, uh, you know, those type of indexes that give you some broad exposure at a very low cost. Uh, and when you talk about when to invest, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we've noticed in this downturn, we had a number of clients that were waiting to move some new money into the markets. And when the market dropped about 15 or 20 percent, they still wanted to wait for it to go lower. And our view on it was when we were up at the highs, their comments generally have been, oh, if it goes down 10 or 15 percent, I'd like to move some of it in. And so I think that it makes sense during a downturn to scale in. So when we got down 15 or 20 percent, I thought it made sense to add some exposure in. So a little bit of dollar cost averaging. But then when the panic really got to the extreme levels, I think it made sense to put larger allocations in. So it wouldn't be the classic dollar cost averaging where you're putting money in every month. It really would be kind of monitoring on a day to day uh, basis if it makes sense to add additional exposure. Again, and this is assuming this is very long-term money. So as a good follow-up to that, given the recent run-up, um, I, I think that's referring to kind of the 2019 kind of run-up prior to the, to the current uh, sell-off we're experiencing. What stocks slash sectors do you like going forward? Well, it's tough to answer if you're kind of looking at it at the end of 2019. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but but where we are today. <laughs> you know, when it comes to individual stocks, uh, you know, when we look at companies with what I'll call really robust balance sheets, uh, you know, we'd be thinking of companies like Microsoft, JP Morgan, Apple, Google, Alibaba, which is a Chinese company, Walmart, Disney, Starbucks, Visa. 
know, Johnson and Johnson, UPS, Facebook, think, um, Intel, Amazon. And I'll say Amazon, a little bit more cyclical, great company. It doesn't have the fortress balance sheet some of the other ones have, but obviously it has a very dominant market position. Goldman Sachs, Home Depot, Verizon. So there's a huge list of companies that we think are well positioned. Uh, you know, I think one of the ones that uh, we like that we thought has such a loyal following that got really beat up was Starbucks. I know it's already recovered a decent amount. I think that makes uh, a lot of sense because everybody I know that's a, like a coffee drinker. They just love their Starbucks. Uh, when it comes to some of the sectors that have been really beat up, I think that's where the, the greatest risk reward is. So if you look at the energy companies or some of the companies, I'll say like Boeing that actually had a lot of damage uh, to their reputation, their balance sheet. Uh, I think the risk reward there is huge. And we've seen the bounce off the bottom for Boeing was enormous. Uh, and just when you heard that they were going to basically get that fiscal backstop from the government. So, you know, I think some of the ones that were really beat up, you have to look at them and probably limit the amount you put in because there's going to be extra risk, but you will get a bigger bounce there. I know Bill Miller, when he was on the, uh, on CNBC, he was talking about even some of the cruise lines and, you know, our view is we're not going to generally invest in those uh, because we think it'll take longer for them to come back. But he also brought up airlines. He was talking about just some of the companies that really got beat up. He thought that we're going to get those fiscal backstops. So I think there's a lot of different opportunities out there. So that, I think that kind of addresses the next question already. Uh, when the virus situation sub so subsides, what stocks will be set to soar? Uh, I think you kind of addressed that unless there's something else that you can think of there, Alp. Um, nope, I think that's good. Yeah. Um, Next here, we got a question, kind of similar to what we've been talking about, but but I think worth worth revisiting here. Should we consider pulling our money, our remaining money, out of the market and parking it until things bottom out and start to recover? So I think we've addressed that, you know, a few different times here. I would say that, uh, you know, for us, if it's long-term money that you really don't need, then you stay invested. I mean, if it's something that's making you really worried about your your I'll call it long-term viability, then, you know, to us, it means you need to take some money off the table, even at inopportune times. But, uh, you know, we're general believers that, and we've showed you the evidence of how quickly the market can bounce back, and you're seeing some of it right now. We've acknowledged we don't know if we're, we're seeing the lows, but uh, we're not big fans of pulling all the money out of the market and parking it. One of the best things anybody can do when they're, when, if they feel like they've they just are losing sleep and are really uncomfortable. Um, as we've already pointed out, it's just, it, it's r impossible to time it twice, right? When to get out and then when to get back in, um, you know, to try to do an all or nothing move with your money. But, but if you're, if you're kind of at that, at that, uh, as some people call it their GMO point or get me out. Um, one of the best moves you can do is just trim, you know, say, you know what, I'm going to feel better if I, you know, move five or ten percent out of the market. You broke uh, up a little on my cash station. reserve. But if the market continues, oh, sorry, yeah. just talking about the but just trimming. Yeah, the last twenty seconds, if you could repeat, you broke up. Sure. Yeah. So just just to how one of the best moves you can do is is rather than trying to make an all or nothing out of the markets, um, just trim. You know, look at saying take five or ten percent off the table. That way you feel better if the markets go down. You said, hey, I did something. I protected myself a little bit on the downside. But then if the if the markets run up, you you can feel good knowing, hey, I stayed invested and I didn't totally miss those those uh, good days like we've been talking about. Um, all right, here, we've got a new question here as we were talking. Uh, sort of back to the fiscal policy uh, question and monetary policy, all kind of related here. Doesn't large infusion of large amounts of money by the government i.e. printing more money, lead to inflation? So probably one of the uh, the most debated questions over the last, you might even say 20 years right now, yeah. for whatever reason, and we scratch our heads. You know, I've been at, uh, like one time we were at a meeting with when Ben Bernanke was presenting, and he actually talked about this subject. Everyone basically has been scratching their heads as to why the printing basically, which clearly is something that should lead to inflation, has not really caused any meaningful inflation. In fact, they're actually trying to get inflation to creep up 
more than it has. Uh, and just so everyone knows, one of the things that I'll say the central banks don't want to see is deflation. So they're doing whatever they can to make sure that we don't have deflation. And the best way to explain it, why they don't want deflation, is if prices go down, think of your house. Let's say you have a $500,000 house with a $400,000 mortgage on it. If that house drops in value to $350,000, you still have your $400,000 mortgage. So nobody wants deflation. So it's been just a very unusual situation that uh, printing money has not really caused inflation. People question whether at some point it's going to rear its ugly head. Uh, but for now, yeah, but it has no been a great head, answer. It has been a head, has been a head scratcher recently. Yep. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off there, Al. Um, sure. I think we are up to date on the questions. Um, I think there was one more that came in that Natalie forwarded to us. Uh, and it was something about the, the new bill that passed, and it was about how would some small businesses that are independent contractors that might qualify for some type of relief. And I'll just say, uh, you know, this just passed. I, I think the best thing to do is, is to wait three or four days, and, and we'll start seeing some guidebooks come out on how people can potentially uh, participate in some of the programs designed to help small business owners. So I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, so we have been sending out um, weekly uh, uh, kind of market commentaries lately with the, the recent uh, you know activity going on, um, and so we're going to try to continue that trend. Uh, may not be perfectly on a week weekly basis, um, but yeah, we, we hope to continue to provide updates and insights on on, on the ever evolving uh, <laughs> uh, markets, stimulus packages, and so on. Um, Alp, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the circling back on the importance of cash buffers um and and i know we've sort of talked about it in in the context of you know if you're drawing money out of the accounts you know to have that cash buffer not only to just kind of help you sleep better um but the importance of not having to sell in a in a panic driven market like we're seeing right now right that 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 you've got that cash buffer in place to cover yourself with enough time for for your equity to recover. Is there anything else you kind of wanted to add there, Al? Well, I think one of the, the best ways to describe what a cash buffer does is, you know, Jason laid it out really nicely. It basically gives you complete peace of mind that you've got two, maybe three years of reserves sitting on the sidelines, whether it's inside of the retirement account, if you're pulling out a certain amount of your retirement account, you know, every month or every year, it's just having that money there, knowing that that's what you're going to be pulling from, regardless of what the market is doing. And so we've had a number of people that, you know, pull out regular amounts from their accounts, basically, just to maintain their standard of living. And a lot of them have said in the recent downturns that, well, we don't want to sell anything right now. Should we stop taking money out of the account? And we've pointed out, no, because we've known you've been taking money out whether it's $5,000, $10,000 a month, whatever the number is, we've actually allocated money to the sidelines in a cash bucket, bucket specifically for this. And so when our clients hear that, they remember we've actually told them that before, but it really is, it just brings a lot of comfort knowing that if you're dependent on this pool of capital, having some set aside for these type of situations is really comforting. You might be upset in a really big up market that you didn't have more money invested, but it's really comforting in these types of scenarios, and most people recognize that. Yeah, we did receive, you know, in 2019, for example, you know, that was such a, a term we often use a kind of a Goldilocks year in the markets. Um, and so periodically, folks would ask, "Hey, hey, how come I'm holding so much cash in my account?" Um, and while we would try to explain it. At the time, I don't know that it always necessarily made perfect sense, but now I think everybody's recognizing, ah, yes, <laughs> now I understand why. <laughs> um, um, and then even beyond just – and when we say cash, right, we're generally just speaking about you know money market accounts, um, you know, very short-term kind of U.S. treasuries. Um, but even beyond just sort of the, the, the cash equivalences, there are other kind of bond funds and fixed income investments that are also very short-term in nature. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see the, the term low duration 
to describe these kinds of bond funds. And that's sort of like the next layer. So even if you don't necessarily have exactly in cash, we generally speaking, there's almost always in a layer of these very short-term uh, bond funds that we can then access to provide the liquidity that's needed before needing to sell um, equities during a time like this. <clears throat> um, let's see. So we're coming up on an hour. I know we want to kind of be respectful of everybody's time here. Alp, anything else that you wanted to to touch on? I think you've done a great job, and uh, I think we've answered all the questions. So, you know, if you have any concerns, as you know, that we're around, uh, and I'm actually in the office, and you know, we, our phone system is such. If you call, you know, Jason's uh, direct dial line, it'll just go straight to his cell phone right now. So. We're very accessible, we're, we're answering emails. So if you have any questions, let us know. If you wanna discuss what we just talked about, let us know. You know. We're here to help you as much as we can. Yeah, I'm just gonna throw out, you know, pl please be on the lookout for our emails. Um, uh, you can also follow us on LinkedIn where we post a lot of uh, updates. I think I have that here on the screen. Um, and then just uh, here's our, you know, our full team. I can't say enough about how uh, how great everybody's been. Uh, please feel free to reach out to anybody on the team like you have normally. Everybody's everybody's working, um, doing a great job. Uh, really couldn't be doing what we're doing without everybody uh, that you see here on this uh, on this screen. So um, yeah, it was a great team, and I uh, really appreciate all. Uh, everybody's questions and 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 uh and good wishes so same same to everybody thank you for tuning in and as alp said don't hesitate to reach out to any of us with any questions or comments or concerns all right take care everybody see you.